agreement on an urgent relief bill for the millions of American workers and small businesses and large businesses that were uh, badly affected by the medical difficulty that we've had. If you had a viable business in January, we are committed to ensuring the same is true in the coming weeks. In fact, we want to make it even better than it was before. And we're doing things to help in that regard. America will again and soon be open for business uh, very soon, a lot sooner than uh, three or four months that somebody was suggesting uh, a lot sooner. We cannot let the cure be worse than the problem itself. We're not going to let the cure be worse than the problem. At the end of the 15 day period, we'll make a decision as to which way we want to go, where we want to go, the timing. And essentially, we're referring to the timing of the opening, essentially the opening of our country, because we have it pretty well shut down in order to get rid of this invisible enemy. Two weeks ago, we moved at record speed to pass paid sick leave and paid family medical leave and approve eight billion dollars, including money for the development of treatments and vaccines. And we're doing tremendous work in both on both fronts. The vaccines are coming along very quickly. Now, Congress must demonstrate the same bipartisanship again and join together to pass the Senate bill as written and avoid playing any more partisan games. They have to get together and just stop with the partisan politics. And uh, I think that's happening. I got a call a little while ago. I guess they're getting closer. It should go quickly. And uh, it must go quickly. It's not really a choice. They don't have a choice. They have to make a deal. This should not be a time for political agendas, but rather one for focusing solely and squarely on the needs of the American people. We are going to save American workers, and we're going to save them quickly. And we're going to save our great American companies, both small and large. This was a medical problem. We are not going to let it turn into a long-lasting financial problem. It started out as a purely medical problem, and it's not going to go beyond that. We're just not going to allow that to happen. Our country was at its strongest financial point. We've never had an economy like we had just a few weeks ago, and then it got uh, hit with something that nobody could have ever thought possible. And we are fixing it. We're fixing it quickly. And I want to just thank the American people for what they've been through and what they're doing. Our country will be stronger than ever before, and we fully anticipate that, and it won't be that long. Let me provide you with an update on critical supplies. FEMA is distributing 8 million N95 respirator masks and 13.3 million surgical masks across the country right now. Focusing on the areas with the greatest need, we have shipped 73 pallets of personal protective equipment to New York City and 36 pallets to the state of Washington. In the past 96 hours, FEMA has also received donations of approximately 6.5 million masks. We're having millions and millions of masks made as we speak and other personal protective equipment, which we will be distributing to medical hotspots. We're focused on some of the hotspots. Across the nation, we're seeing an outpouring of creativity and innovative ideas widely shared between the federal health leaders, governors, and mayors, the scientific community, and members of the private sector. Uh, really working together. Everybody's working together. I'm pleased to report that clinical trials in New York will begin existing for existing drugs that may prove effective against the virus. At my direction, the federal government is working to help obtain large quantities of chloroquine. And uh, you can look from any standpoint tomorrow in New York. We think tomorrow pretty early, the hydroxychloroquine and uh, the z -Pack, I think, is a combination probably is looking very, very good, and it's going to be distributed. We have uh, 10,000 units going, and it'll be uh, distributed tomorrow. Uh, it'll be available, uh, and is now. They already have it. They're going to distribute it tomorrow morning to a lot of people in New York City and New York. 
Uh, we're studying it very closely, watching it very closely. You probably saw a couple of articles today came out where a gentleman, they thought he was not going to make it. He said goodbye to his family. They had given him the drug just a little while before, but he thought it was over. His family thought he was uh, going to die. And a number of hours later, he woke up, felt good. Then he woke up again, and he felt really good, and he's in good shape. And he's very happy for this particular um, drug that we got approved in record-setting time. There's never been anything even close to it. And I want to thank the FDA which has been incredible, and Dr. Hahn, Stephen Hahn, highly respected man, but they're doing everything possible to increase production and available supply of these drugs, not only this drug, but also others that are coming. Uh, Rendesivir is coming from Regeneron. Uh, a couple of others are also under study, but the one that I'm very excited about right now is the one we just mentioned, and I think there's a, a real chance, I mean, again, uh, we don't know, but there's a real chance that it could have a tremendous impact. It would be a gift from God if that worked. That would be a big game changer. So we'll see. But distribution starts tomorrow morning early in New York, and I think a lot of people are going to be, hopefully they're going to be very happy with the result, but we're all going to be watching closely. It's something we have to try. It's been very, very successful on malaria. Very, very successful. And uh, countries with malaria have had an uh, interesting thing happen. Uh, they take this particular drug. It's a very powerful drug. And uh, there is very little semblance of the virus in those countries. And there are those that say because this drug is very prevalent because of the malaria. So we'll see what happens. I'm also announcing that we're postponing the deadline for compliance with real ID requirements at a time when we're asking Americans to maintain social distancing. We do want to require people to go with their local DMV. We will be announcing the new deadline very soon. It's going to be announced in a very short moment overnight. We successfully brought home 103 American citizens after they had been stranded for 10 days in Brazil. Following a cruise, we want to thank the Brazilian government and their great president. Most of those returned were senior citizens. My administration, in cooperation with Governor Greg Abbott of Texas and the private sector, coordinated their safe return to the United States. So thank you to Governor Abbott. Terrific governor, terrific man. Earlier today, I signed an executive order invoking presidential authority under Section 4512 of the Defense Production Act to prohibit the hoarding of vital medical equipment and supplies, such as hand sanitizers, face masks, and personal protective equipment. We have a lot of face masks, a lot of equipment just coming in, and we have some people hoarding, and Attorney General Barr is going to be speaking about that in a second. We want to prevent price gouging and uh, critical health and medical resources are going to be protected in every form. Under this directive, the Secretary of Health and Human Services is authorized to de designate essential health and medical supplies as scarce. So he'll designate certain supplies and medical elements as scarce, and that means it will be a crime to stockpile these items in excessive quantities, which is happening to a relatively small degree, we think, but nevertheless, it's happening. We can't let it happen. And we can't let them resell them at excessive prices, which some people are doing. Uh, very simply, yeah. we will not allow anyone to exploit the suffering of American citizens for their own profit. So we're going to be watching that with our great attorney general very closely. The Department of Justice will be aggressively prosecuting fraudulent schemes related to the pandemic. Yesterday, federal prosecutors took action in their first case, shutting down a website selling a totally fake vaccine, if you can believe that one. As president, I will always fight to protect Americans from being exploited. Thankfully, 
All throughout you the hear country, that? we're witnessing extraordinary acts of compassion, Message benevolence, and unity. Patriot. Construction companies are donating masks by the hundreds of thousands. Manufacturing workers are transforming their assembly lines. Citizens are volunteering to deliver food and medicine to the elderly. We're truly seeing America at its best. We're really seeing things that people never thought even could happen. Frankly, we never thought this could happen. But the way uh, most Americans are, are working toward getting it solved and, and just doing what they have to do to make this go away has been incredible. It's been incredible. I want to take a moment to thank the everyday heroes who are making our vast effort against the virus possible. And thank you to the healthcare workers and the first responders. These are very brave people. Thanks also to the hardworking men and women of Federal Express, UPS, United States Postal Service, and the truckers who are maintaining our supply chains and supply lines. Uh, we thank you very much. Great job. We also want to give our regards and thanks to everyone at our grocery stores working the night shift so that shelves can be restocked, and the restaurant workers and delivery drivers keeping our families fed. Uh, so many of these restaurants, it's incredible they're doing uh, service where people come and they pick it up, uh, delivery. I mean, it's been incredible what they've been doing. Totally different business they, than they were in, other than they cook food. Other than that, it's like a totally different business. Most of all, I want to thank the American people for rising to the challenge and showing incredible courage, determination, patience, grace, and grit. From New York to Seattle and everywhere in between, your acts of selflessness and sacrifice and ingenuity are a powerful testament to the American character. It's really being shown. It's really showing up at a level that uh, people are really respecting. All over the world, they're respecting. And the world has problems. We're at 148 countries now. 148 countries are affected by the invisible scourge. And all of the uplifting reflections of the American spirit are out there for everyone to see. Together, we will care for our fellow citizens, and we will win this war, and we'll win it uh, much sooner than people think. And we'll be back in business as a country pretty soon. You'll be hearing about that also pretty soon. Now I'd like to uh, ask Attorney General Bill Barr to say a few words, and we'll take questions in a little while, thank you. <clears throat> Let me start uh, by thanking uh, you, Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, for your uh, decisive leadership in this unprecedented battle to save American lives. At the Department of Justice, we're working hard to protect the health and safety of our personnel while at the same time uh, keeping our enforcement efforts at full throttle. Uh, so I'd like to thank all of my colleagues in law enforcement, not just those at the federal level, but uh, of all our state and local partners, the police officers, the sheriff's deputies who are protecting and serving their communities, often at, at great risk to themselves. Um, what I'd like to do here is start with a few remarks about the order that the president mentioned uh, to ensure the availability of critical medical uh, and health supplies from hoarding and price gouging. On March 18th, the president issued Executive Order 13909 invoking the Defense Production Act with respect to the health and medical resources needed to respond to the spread of COVID-19, including PPE and ventilators. We have started to see some evidence of potential hoarding and price gouging. And so earlier today, the president signed a second executive order providing the authority to address, if it becomes necessary, hoarding that threatens the supply of those necessary health and medical resources. Under Section 102 of the Defense Production Act, the President is authorized to prohibit the hoarding of needed resources by designating those materials as scarce or as materials whose supply would be threatened 
by persons accumulating ex ex excessive amounts. Once specific materials are so designated, persons are prohibited from accumulating those items in excess of reasonable personal or business needs or for the purpose of selling them in excess of prevailing <coughs> market prices. It is a crime to engage in prohibited activity. In today's executive order, the President is delegating to the Secretary of HHS this authority to protect against hoarding by designating these critical items. Now, no items have been designated over. yet, and the Department of Justice is going to be working with HHS to identify cases where hoarding may be impeding the supply of health and medical resources needed to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, we convened our first task force meeting, a national task force, that will be working on these supply chain issues and specifically on the problem of hoarding and price gouging. And we are designating in each of our 93 United States Attorney's offices a lead prosecutor who will be responsible in that district for uh, pursuing these cases. I also want to say that we have not waited for this order to be signed. We, as we have received evidence recently, we have already initiated investigations of activities uh, that are disrupting the supply chain and suggestive of hoarding. I want to stress that we're not talking about consumers or businesses stockpiling supplies for their own operations. We're talking about people hoarding these goods and materials on an industrial scale for the purpose of manipulating the market and ultimately deriving windfall profits. If you are have a big supply of toilet paper in your house, this is not something you have to worry about. But if you are sitting on a, on a warehouse uh, with masks, uh, surgical masks, you will be hearing a knock on your door. So with that, Mr. President, uh, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much. Deborah, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. To start, I want to really thank all the ministers of health around the world who have been sending us their data, despite the fight that they're in themselves, um, particularly our European colleagues. They continue to send us um, primarily their mortality data, which is really very critical, because when you're in the midst of this level of fight that many of the European countries are, Following mortality data will give you the best insight right now on how the epidemic is proceeding in those countries because they really can't be testing at the level to really understand the depth and breadth of their new cases. In the mortality data that has been provided to us, there has been no child under 15 that has succumbed to the virus in Europe. There was the one 14-year-old in China. So we still see that there is less severity in children. And so that should be reassuring to the moms and dads out there. To Generation Z and to my millennial colleagues who have been really at the forefront of many of these responses, less than 1% of all the mortality is less than 50 and so this is, I think, also a very important point. That doesn't mean that individuals won't have severe disease. So still 99% of all the mortality coming out of Europe in general is over 50 and pre-existing conditions. The pre-existing condition piece still holds in Italy with the majority of the mortality having three or more pre-existing conditions. I think this is reassuring to all of us, but it doesn't change the need to continue to protect the elderly. And in order to protect the elderly, we all need to continue to do the president's directives and guidance for the next week of the 15-day challenge. Finally, I wanted to really close by thanking the laboratory personnel that have been at the front lines. 250,000 tests have been run in the last seven days. This happened because these large commercial laboratories are doing round-the-clock runs. And remember, all of them being, are being exposed to the virus in the same way from the swabs. Yet tirelessly, they have worked on and on to get those results available. They are still getting more tests than they can run per day. That's because we were primarily expanded into the what we call the Roche high-throughput tricore machine. 
those results have been getting to the clients and we've asked them to prioritize hospitalized patients. There was a breakthrough today, and I think you'll see this from the FDA, um, in, for all of those of you who are waiting for self-swabbing options, those are going to be available in some time this week um, to be able to individuals do their own tests. That said, remember these platforms are keeping up with those who need to be diagnosed in the hospitals and all those who come to the emergency room quite ill so that hospital beds can be freed up for those that don't have COVID. So that will be critical that if you don't need a test and if it doesn't change your clinical course, do not come in to be tested. And I think that mortality data that I gave you should be very reassuring to all of you. Finally, to conclude, um, New York City. The New York metro area of New Jersey, New York City, and parts of Long Island have uh, an attack rate close to one in a 1,000. This is five times what the other areas are seeing. There, through the high throughput lab investigations, we're finding that 28% of the submitted specimens are positive from that area, where it's less than 8% in the rest of the country. So to all of my friends and colleagues in New York, this is the group that needs to absolutely social distance and self-isolate at this time. Clearly, the virus had been circulating there for a number of weeks to have this level of penetrance into the general community. Thank you very much, Deborah. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the White House Coronavirus Task Force uh, met today, but we uh, also convened, at the President's direction, a conference call with the uh, nation's governors. We focused on efforts at mitigation, uh, at testing, and, uh, and supplies. We discussed the President's uh, recent approval of disaster declarations for Washington uh, and California and New York. Uh, but we also assured governors who've submitted major disaster declarations that, that we will be reviewing them in an expeditious manner to ensure the full resources the federal government are brought to bear. The president wanted us to make it clear that uh, the federal government will do whatever it takes uh, to support an effort that is locally executed, state managed, and federally supported. Uh, we have reiterated that to our governors today, listened to them about their specific needs, uh, and, uh, and frankly, made it clear to them uh, that while the president uh, has published at coronavirus.gov the 15 days to slow the spread for every American, and millions of Americans are addressing these common sense guidelines uh, to prevent uh, the spread of the coronavirus uh, in the days ahead, we made it clear to the governors that this president and this administration fully supports decisions that governors are making in communities and states that are particularly impacted by the spread of the coronavirus, and we are grateful uh, for their efforts. Uh, we also spoke to the governors about the importance of the legislation that is currently being negotiated on Capitol Hill uh, and uh, asked them to encourage members of the House and the Senate to move very quickly. The bill that is currently being negotiated, the President uh, said that he believes will be resolved soon, and we're encouraged by it. We'll speed direct payments to families. The average family of four will receive $3,000 directly. There'll be payroll uh, subsidies for small businesses around America to keep people on the payroll while they might be required to stay home. Unemployment insurance benefits, assistance to hospitals and major industries, and we continue to urge the Congress to act uh, and, uh, and ask the governors to engage their delegations. On the subject of testing, uh, we reiterated our thanks uh, to states across the country that are rapidly expanding testing at, at uh, drive through sites and at community sites. Uh, and uh, as, uh, as Dr. Burks just reflected, because of, the, because of the unprecedented public and private partnership uh, that uh, the president initiated with our commercial labs, uh, we stand here today um, with 313,000 tests having been completed with the test results delivered to Americans and um, uh, still uh, uh, somewhat more than 41,000 have contracted uh, coronavirus. Uh, but this state-run effort uh, is continuing to receive the full support of our team at FEMA and at the U.S. Public Health Service. We're deploying personnel, we're deploying resources, 
and testing is literally expanding around the country uh, by the hour. As Dr. Burse also mentioned, uh, the FDA has uh, been in the process of reviewing less invasive methods of uh, testing. Uh, the president and I both reflected on the fact that that we uh, have been tested and uh, uh, we've been working with the FDA to uh, to make it possible for self-collected nasal swabs where individuals could, at the end of their nasal passage, collect a sample. And um, uh, I'm pleased to report that... Uh, that self-collected swabs can now be collected in clinics and at drive-through testing sites. This will expedite the testing process, of course, but it will also reduce the risk to health care providers uh, for exposure to the coronavirus, and it will minimize the drain on personal protective equipment. With the current test that goes pretty significantly up the nasal passage, people have to wear gear and then change out the gear. And this new self-administered test will actually not require the drain on, uh, on personal protective equipment. And it's all a part of our effort, uh, as, uh, as Admiral uh, Polovchek will discuss in just a few moments, uh, to meet the supply needs that we have across the country, but, but to meet them with efforts at conservation as well. On the subject of testing, uh, uh, it's important to remember, as the old book said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And so uh, if you don't have symptoms, you don't need to get a coronavirus test. Uh, we encourage uh, every American to adhere to that so that the testing resources are available for people that are symptomatic. Uh, we also will be issuing today from Health and Human Services new guidance uh, to direct all commercial labs to prioritize testing for hospitalized patients. And that guidance is going out tonight. We also reminded the governors today that all state laboratories, all hospital laboratories are now required by law to report the results of coronavirus tests to the CDC. On the subject of supplies, in our meeting today at FEMA, uh, we received a report of the new supply chain stabilization task force Rear Admiral John uh, Polovchek uh, is leading that up uh, at FEMA, uh, and the task force is, uh, is working to identify medical supplies that exist in the marketplace today to evaluate the national stockpile and also working with industries around the country to produce even more of the critical medical supplies. And as the President said, businesses across America are stepping up, and maybe as never before in our history. 3M, in fact, has diverted 500,000 N95 masks from commercial customers, and they're being delivered today to New York and Seattle. Facebook, we would acknowledge, has donated their emergency reserve of over 700,000 N95 masks to healthcare workers, and these are just a few examples of the generosity of businesses. We're also seeing companies step forward to repurpose their manufacturing facilities uh, to create ventilators, to create equipment. Uh, and I know I speak for the president when I say how grateful and proud we are for that. We also discussed uh, with the governors uh, a real breakthrough on the availability of ventilators. We called on the governors to serve it all, survey all outpatient surgical centers and hospital operating rooms because surgical ventilators that a senior, uh, uh, anesthesiologists use because of an FDA uh, decision uh, rendered this last weekend, those can be easily converted now to ventilators that can be used for people struggling with severe illness from the coronavirus. And so we called on our governors in, in conversations with state leaders to, to survey all of their surgical centers and hospital operating rooms to identify that equipment and with the new FDA guidelines, uh, they'll be able to convert those to meet, help meet the needs of ventilators across the country. We are now eight days into the president's 15 days to slow the spread. And the American people are rising to the challenge. We're doing this. Uh, but in the days that remain between now and the end of the 15 days, uh, we're going to need every American to take this seriously. Listen to your state and local health authorities where there may be additional and stronger guidance in areas where the coronavirus spread has been more severe. But for every American, know that the part that you do, that your family does, that you do in your community to put into practice these principles of social distancing, using a drive-through at the local restaurant, 
uh, will make an enormous difference in in lowering the trajectory uh, of the coronavirus spreading across our country. Uh, it's going to take all of us, but with the ongoing cooperation of the American people, with compassion, with the ingenuity of, uh, of American industry, with dedicated leadership at the state and federal level, I know that we can slow the spread, we can protect our most vulnerable, and we will heal our land. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. So I'm, uh, I'm Rear Admiral John Polovchek. I'm the Supply Chain Task Force Lead at FEMA. My task is to increase the supply of critical medical supplies, which include personal protective equipment and ventilators, items like that. I just want to take a few moments to explain the organization that we've stood up this week, these last few days. And our, and our approach. So you have a chart behind, behind me. I have a focused, uh, two focus leads, uh, one on personal protective equipment, built, uh, medical supplies, and a focus lead on ventilators. Operating under four lines of effort. First line of effort you see is preservation. And, and the leaders tonight have talked about that ability to make our stuff last longer. Acceleration. We have a team of people that are uh, searching the globe for uh, personal protective equipment, figuring out where it is, figuring out if we need to buy it or just transport it and get it here faster. We have a, a line of effort called reallocation. We're working with our industry partners to illuminate the supply chain. There are many vendors, many distributors, all on separate system. Nobody has one site picture for that supply chain. We've brought our, our industry partners in. We're weaving that together to make better allocation decisions and understand where it is and where it needs to go. We have an, uh, a line called expansion. You've heard some of that today. Um, if, if those that have wanted to convert plants, those that want to get into the business, we have the tools to, to help them to go do that. So two focus areas right now, PPE, and ventilators, four lines of effort working the problem to, of the task to, to get more here, increase the supplies. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, if I could like to, the one person reporting that the total deaths today crossed 100 for the first time. This morning, your Surgeon General on the Today Show said he wanted Americans to understand that this is going to get really bad. Do you share that prognosis? Of course I do. It's going to be bad. And we have uh, a lot of people dying from the flu, as you know. We have a very bad flu season on top of everything else. It's very bad. It looks like it could be over 50,000. And uh, certainly this is going to be bad. And we're trying to make it uh, so that it's much, much less bad. And that's what we're doing. I think we're doing a very good job of it. If you look at other countries, what they've been through, and you look at the kind of numbers and compare them to ours, which is a much larger country than most uh uh, the numbers are pretty amazing, and it started with the fact that we stopped people from coming in from a highly affected area and, and infected area, and uh, that was a good thing to do. So, yeah, it's bad, and it's going to, obviously, the numbers are going to increase with time, and then they're going to start to decrease, and we're going to be uh, opening our country up for business because our country was meant to be open and uh, working with others, uh, but especially for our workers. And uh, the engine for that whole system is we have to have companies, and these companies are loved by our workers because they're paying big salaries and big, big dollars to our workers, and we're going to get it all going again very soon, hopefully very, very soon. Please. Sir, I'm, I'm just trying to reconcile the two things that you just said. One, that uh, things are going to be very, very bad. Uh, and two, that you want to get the country open back yeah. up as quickly as possible. So I guess my question is, if in a week uh, Dr. Burks or Dr. Fauci are telling you we need to continue these measures uh, for the health of the vulnerable population of the country, are you going to say, I'm sorry, the, the economy is too important? Um, well, you, you see what happens. Uh, I, I understand the question very well. It's a, it's a great question, but... Uh, 
We can do two things at one time. I will say this. Our country's learned a lot. We've learned about social distancing. We've learned about the hands. We've learned about uh, uh, staying away, at least during the time that this is even uh, a little bit around uh, this disease or or whatever you want to call it, many different names. You can go up many different names, but the virus, while it's around. And uh, we can start thinking about, as an example, uh, parts of our country are very lightly affected, uh, very small numbers. And, you know, you look at a state, great governor, Pete Ricketts, uh, in Nebraska. Uh, you look at uh, the kind of numbers they have out there. They have one of the great... One of the great hospitals there, too, relative to what we're talking about. But uh, you look at Nebraska, you look at Idaho, you look at Iowa, you look at uh, many, I could name many countries that are handling it very, very well and that are not affected to the same extent or, frankly, not even nearly to the extent of New York, which is really, I'm dealing with uh, Governor Cuomo, uh, and we're dealing very well together. We'll, we'll be sending that ship up, by the way, as you know. We have a ship going to Los Angeles. We'll also be, uh, the ship is coming out of a, a very large repair. It's all ready to go. It very, very soon will be. And over the next three or four weeks, that will be coming up to New York. We'll go to New York Harbor, and it will be fully supplied. So uh, they're working on that right now. Uh, maybe Dr. Burns can speak to this. Do you share the president's optimism that in a week we might have a situation where we can say, you know, there's a few hot spots, uh, but much of the country... Well, I didn't say in a week, but I said soon. It's going to be uh, soon. It's not going to be three or four months, as uh, some people were saying, and a lot of people thought originally, but I would certainly yeah. let you and, answer. Are you worried that some of the cities and states that haven't had the infection yet are lagging indicators and that we're going to start seeing cases? So you raised two important issues. One, I think you all know a lot of our tests have had to go to hospitals at this time so that we can diagnose people who are at risk to give them options to get these new therapeutic options. None of these therapeutic options are available if you don't know your diagnosis. So we've been very much focused on that. With adding Abbott, Thermo Fisher, Hologic, and now on Cepheid platforms. Cepheid is that new platform that is point of care but slower. So, you know, you've got to match the throughput, the need to what kind of equipment you have. Now that we have all those platforms moving simultaneously, we can go back to doing case finding and surveillance in the areas that have the most lower numbers, as well as doing mitigation more aggressively in the places that have higher numbers. We went out with a very blunt force. I mean, we have to all be honest. We had to do that because we weren't sure where the virus was and where it is going. I think over this week, we're concentrated on figuring out exactly where the virus is and making projections about where it's going and the impact of our mitigation pieces. We learned this in, in tackling epidemics around the world. You have to focus the resources and the intervention and the structural prevention interventions in the areas where the virus is circulating. Otherwise, people never understand why you're doing this and they don't have any virus. So it has to be very tailored geographically and it may have to also be very tailored by age group really understanding who's at the greatest risk and understanding how to protect them. But there's data showing that in three months, as the president said, we won't need broad, uh, to follow these broad guidelines that, we've, that he's The laid. only data that we all have, and I think you all know what it is, the two areas that have moved through their curve is China and South Korea. So those are the two countries that we're learning from. Those were eight to 10 week curves. Each state in each hotspot in the United States is going to be its own curve because the seeds came in at different times. So Washington state is on their curve. They're about two weeks ahead of New York. And so each of these have to be done in a very granular way to really understand where we are. And it's the charge that the president has given us is to use all of our data analytics and all of our data inputs to really define those issues about where the virus is, where is it going, and what predictions we can make about when, where we are in that bell-shaped curve. I think that's a great definition. And I will say we're going to be watching our senior citizens very closely. We're going to be watching... Uh, certain hotspots like New York, and within New York you have 
areas which are troubling, and we'll be working with the governor and the mayor and everybody else on those spots. Uh, but at the same time, at a certain point, we have to get open and we have to be uh, we have to get moving. We don't want to lose these companies. We don't want to lose these workers. We want to take care of our workers. So we'll be doing something, uh, I think, relatively quickly. But we've learned a lot during this period. This was a very necessary period. Uh, tremendous information was gained, but we can do two things at one time. You know, and again, I say we have uh, a very active flu season, more active than most. It's looking like it's heading to 50,000 or more deaths, deaths, not cases, 50,000 deaths, uh, which is, uh, that's a lot. And uh, you look at uh, automobile accidents, which are far greater than any numbers we're talking about. That doesn't mean we're going to tell everybody no more driving of cars. So we, we have to do things uh, to get our country open. But this has been an incredible period of learning, and we'll have announcements over the next uh, fairly short period as to the timing. John, please. Uh, Mr. I want to ask about these guidelines on testing. Obviously, Senator Rand Paul has tested positive uh, for coronavirus. Um, but he was not in contact with anybody who was known positive, and he didn't have any major symptoms. Under your guidelines, under the guidelines that have been outlined here, he would not have gotten a test. He got one anyway. So what do you say to him? He's pointed out that if he hadn't gone basically in defiance of these guidelines and got tested, he might still be showing up to the Senate right now and infecting the whole U.S. Senate. So that's why this was important. That's why this recommendation to the American people was important. Because we have been saying that there is a level of asymptomatic or mild spread. Um, and that's why each person has to be responsible. Each person has to be responsible in the way that they decrease their interaction with others, the six feet, and you're all very social distanced, so thank you, but also <coughs> assuming that everyone that you're interacting with could be positive. And that gets into the hand-washing piece, and that gets into the other piece we talked about is surfaces. I think until we really figure out the respiratory transmission versus the surface transmission and this hard surface transmission, not fabric, will be really critical because that is a way the virus could spread on subways or metros where people would be holding on to things that other people had recently held on to. But so that's the real question. But if we can just keep with the example of Rand Paul, obviously there are many other people that would be in a similar situation, but just keep with this one example. If he hadn't gotten that test, he would still be showing up to the Senate every day, to his place of work. If he had you been following that, these guidelines, he wouldn't have been infecting others because of the social distancing, washing your hands, doing everything that we, we talked about. So we've talked about also how people make choices because of their jobs that they have to come in. You'll notice I was not here over the weekend. I think this is the part that we really need to take personal responsibility for. Saturday, I had a little low-grade fever. Uh-oh. <laughs> so, actually, probably a GI thing. But, you know, I'm meticulous. I'm a physician. <laughs> I looked it up. I ended up piggy bank. I'm from Walter Reed, so I got a test late Saturday night, and I'm negative. I stayed home another day just to... <laughs> Just, yeah, just to make sure. That's how we protect one another. So, you know, unless everybody's taking their temperature every day, we can't say that he had no symptoms. These are the kinds of things that we have to do for one another. This is the personal responsibility that I'm talking about that we all have to practice. Hey, Mr. President, when you say you don't want the cure uh, uh, to be worse um, uh, than, 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 the, than the problem, problem itself, so if, are you saying that if we kept these measures that we're doing now in place in mouth, for a couple of months, two months? Well, they will be in place. Uh, at some point, we're going to open up our country, and it's going to be fairly soon. Weeks or months? Uh, I'm, not looking, I'm not looking at months, I can tell you right now. We're going to be opening up our country, and uh, we're going to be watching certain areas, and we're going to be practicing everything that... Uh, that Deborah's referring to right here. No, we're going to be watching this very closely, but uh, you can't keep it closed for the next, uh, you know, for years. Okay, this is going away. We're we're going to win the battle, but we also have, uh, you know, you have tremendous responsibility. We have jobs. We have 
uh, people get tremendous anxiety and depression and uh, you have suicides over things like this when you have terrible economies you have death uh, probably in I mean definitely would be in far greater numbers than the numbers that we're talking about with regard to the virus so we have an obligation we have a double obligation uh, 